I'm Laura Carlo, and I'm your early morning host on Classical Radio Boston, WCRB here in Boston. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's Beyond the Page with award-winning author Lily King. Uh, before we welcome our guest, let me explain how this evening's mechanics are going to work. Uh, we are using Zoom webinar. And as our audience, we cannot see or hear you, but we do want to hear from you. You can ask any question during the course of the conversation by opening up the Q&A tab that's at the bottom of your screen and typing in your question. You can put your questions in at any point during the conversations as well. We're going to do our best to address as many of the questions as we possibly can. And if you see a question that you'd love to hear an answer to, vote for it by clicking the thumbs up icon on the Q&A tab. The most popular questions are going to rise to the top. Now to activate Zoom automated captioning feature, select the closed captioning button at the bottom of your screen. Select live transcript. Two transcription display options will pop up. We recommend that you can select subtitle to enable captioning at the bottom of the screen. You can also select full transcript. A sidebar window will open where you can see what each speaker is saying. Please bear in mind that closed captioning might be slightly delayed. And now that all the housekeeping is done, in just a moment, we're going to be joined by New York Times best-selling author, Lily King. Lily grew up here in Massachusetts, and after receiving her master's in creative writing from Syracuse University, she took a job as a high school English teacher in Valencia, Spain. And that's where she began writing her first novel. Eight years, 10 more moves all over the U.S., and many bookstore, restaurant, and teaching jobs later. Her first novel, The Pleasing Hour, was published. She's now the author of five novels and one collection of short stories, receiving awards such as the Kirkus Award, the New England Book Award, the Barnes & Noble Discovery Award, Whiting Award, and so many more. Ms. King was included in Time's Top 10 Fiction Books for 2014 for her novel, Euphoria, as well as on Amazon, NPR, Entertainment Weekly, and Publishers Weekly. To talk more about all her work, please welcome Lily King. There Hi. she is. How are you? Hi. Uh, so, um, again, we're encouraging our listeners to to send questions if they have any for Lily King, but I'm going to get the party started, if you will. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight, Lily. We really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. I'm so happy to be here. And hello, Massachusetts. I miss you. <laughs> Well, we miss you too, but you're, you're next door in Maine and Maine used to be part of Massachusetts. So we're all cool. <laughs> um, I like to do a past, present, future type of pro progression in my questions. So let's start with um, when you knew you wanted to be a writer. Was it as a child, a teenager or older? It was definitely as a child. I have I have a few memories. My my memory is that I read Judy Bloom. Um, first, Are You There, Goddess Me, Margaret? And then um, It's Not the End of the World. And at some point between one of those books, I think it was Are You There, God, It's Me, Margaret. I I loved reading and I always loved reading. But now I'm, I was about eight years old and I just thought to myself, I want to write books like this. Because, because I'd never, it was so realistic, you know, it was just families and dialogue. And before all this other stuff I'd read was, was very, you know, fantasy or talking animals, or this was the first kind of realism. And I really responded to it. And I remember thinking, oh, that's what I want to do for my career. But apparently my mother had a different story. And she said that 
when I was about six years old, I went downtown um, to this um, friend of hers who was a dressmaker. And I went, I rode my bike and I had my little pad and I told him I'm going to be a writer when I grow up, but I have no recollection of that. Wow. Or of riding downtown alone <laughs> on a bicycle as a six year old. <laughs> so did, did you find yourself writing little bits for maybe when you grew up and wrote your big novel all along or, or was it, I'm going to just be a novelist when I grow up and then you put it off until you grew up. Yeah. I think what happened, we didn't ever have any creative writing of any kind in grade school until eighth grade. And I had, I would, there was some sort of assignment, like, um, write instructions, like how to make, I think I chose how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, which was pretty much my favorite food. And uh, and I remember having fun with it. And it was the first time that I'd actually kind of really played around. I'm sure I wrote letters and stuff, definitely, um, and notes to friends. But but that was the first time that I kind of had fun writing for school. And then and then I went to a high school that offered creative writing um, junior and senior year, and I took it both years. And then I was completely hooked. Wow. All right. So almost everybody thinks that they have a novel in them. In fact, um, one poll did a survey within the past year that said over 70% of us <laughs> think that there's a novel inside. Um, so um, the thing is, very few of us ever put pen to paper. Any thoughts on on why that is? Well, it's scary. I mean, it's a huge time commitment and it's one thing to, you know, feel like you have it in you and another thing to sit down day after day and do the work. I think it's, it's just, it takes, you know, a certain amount of discipline and also a, a certain amount of, um, you know, risk factor. Like it's not your people aren't used to really doing things that don't kind of have a guaranteed outcome. I mean, you could spend five years on this and fail like that is a, you know, it's as it's as um, kind of unpredictable as opening a restaurant, you know, <laughs> and uh, and and I think you I, I don't know, for me, I was just sort of young and dumb and foolish and I didn't have any other options. I wasn't good at anything else. I mean, you know, I think a lot of people um, are good at a lot of things and they often choose sort of the more sensible thing. Um, but I also really urge people to take that risk because, you know, even if it doesn't, I don't know, you know, find a publisher, find an agent, uh, it just, it's an incredibly fulfilling thing to do. You know, you, you're you so surprised by what comes out and you think you have an idea, but when you actually apply it and really start writing it, you have so much more to say than you thought you did. So that brings me to the question about process. Do you get inspired and have to sit down right away and start typing? Are you disciplined? I'm going to sit down and start writing for two hours every single day and I don't budge from that or something in between. What do you do to put your words on paper? I mean, I, I when I'm when I'm writing a novel, I'm writing a novel and I'm trying to do it every day for at least two hours. Um, and it does have to be a very disciplined thing. And there are so many days that don't go well. You know, either nothing comes out or stuff comes out that you don't like or and I think you you have to be sure not to judge it because you're not a very good judge of what you're writing while you're writing it. <laughs> you know, it, you're a much better judge a week later. Um, but yes, I, I discipline, especially for a novelist. I think there are other forms. I think poets, you know, have more of a tendency to wait till they're inspired. Novelists are really like bankers. Like you just you, you put in the hours. I, I do, you know, um, Monday through Friday and I take the weekends off just because I got used to that when I had kids. Um, I mean, I still have kids, but <laughs> they don't live at home. Um, and 
I, yeah, I think the the discipline part of it is is very important. But then when a novel is finished, then you have to do all kinds of other things and you're not writing every day, at least I'm not. Um, and then, and then, and then when I start writing again, when I get the idea that's going to work, then I have to retrain myself. It, it's not, it, I have to retrain it every, every single time. So what happens when you're washing dishes or driving down the road and the idea happens? Do you have to pull over right away and write it down in the notebook or, or do you let it ruminate? What, what yeah. happens so then? It's interesting that you mentioned driving. Do you, do you find that that's sort of a creative time and inspiring time? I really do too. Um, I've gotten my euphoria. I got the whole ending, the whole last chapter while I was turning off an exit to go meet a friend for lunch. Um, and I literally was scribbling as I was turning off this exit because I, I have to write it down immediately or I will definitely forget it. Um, so, so that I, whole thing in the museum was you driving. Yeah. That's yeah. really, that's wild to me. No, I wrote it that night. Like I, I, I took notes and then that night I just sat down and I wrote the chapter. And I mean, I had already handed it in to my editor and my book, my 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 writers group um and then i had to you know send them the new chapter because the 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 book was supposed to end the chapter before and that would have been a disaster i mean that is a much worse book without that chapter i think <laughs> that that last chapter just left me with my mouth open it's like oh. <laughs> and and i look for those moments um and by the way you mentioned that um margaret mead a life was uh, one of the reference points for you for Euphoria. I pulled it off my shelf so that I could read it again. I haven't read this in about 20 years. So I want you to know you, your book Euphoria gave me homework. <laughs> <laughs> and it was it was a delightful homework, by the way, not, not a chore at all. But I love that, um, that it, you know, it's, what do they say? It's like the rabbit hole. You, you're going down and you're you're finding new things to pull in to, yeah. the, to the whole experience. Yeah, yeah. And the, the companion to that that I would recommend is a biography about Gregory Bateson. Yeah. I think there's only one and I'm totally blanking on the guy's name. It's David, but I can't remember the last name. I'm so sorry. Um but that is that is equally as engrossing, and 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 probably the reason that I wrote that book from from, you know, a, a character who is a lot like Gregory Bateson, um, you know, I wrote it from his perspective just because he really got me. Well, this this makes me remember. I think it was a T-shirt might have been a cross stitch, you know, a little snarky cross stitch, but I, I think for sure it was a t-shirt where it says, be careful how you treat me. You could end up in my novel. <laughs> so ever have any thoughts that people you've come across in your life? I mean, real people are behind the character people that you write about. Yeah, I mean, there's no question that um, that I am drawing from, you know, lots and lots of different experiences and memories and fragments of moments. Um, I feel like for me, novel writing is, or short story writing is, um, it's just kind of a swirl of what I've read, what I've experienced and what I can imagine. And it just, it kind of, you know, you don't really know what percentage, you know, is going to be there at any, on any given page, but it's all, it all kind of mixes up and, and it's always surprising how it, how it comes out on the page. And sometimes, sometimes I think I'm dealing with imagination and then much later I'm like, oh, that came from that. And, you know, and, and I will have kind of substituted various things for for the real thing. And I disguised it so much that I didn't even realize it while I was writing it, you know? Um, but I try very hard, you know, not to hurt, like not to go directly and um, 
you know, wound people or in any way or make them so transparent that, um, that, you know, they would be hurt by it. Uh, the Jane Smith in your life is not going to show up as Joan Smythe, in other words. <laughs> right? Right. Um, so I, I'm famous for writing notes in the books that I read. <laughs> And I have writers and lovers here. And there was a um, there was a, a line that you wrote that stuck with me. And I wanted to mention it to you. I don't write because I think I have something to say. I write because if I don't, everything feels even worse. Your character is saying this. But does that come from a place deep inside Lily King? It sure does. It sure does. I don't know why. I mean, it's a lot like exercise. I feel so much better when I exercise and I feel so much better when I write. And I do think, I do, th maybe there are some people who just have everything that's inside them in their head. They know what it is. But for me, I really, for whatever reason, I have to write things down um to to process my life you know to process you know just writing in a journal and then and then creating i don't know just imagining another world i think also i mean it has to do with getting things up and out but i also think it has to do with control um i think why i was so attracted to writing from a young age is that um my family life was very out of control, especially in high school when I started really getting serious about writing. And um, I, I do think that there is a, is a way in which writing makes you feel like you have more control over a world that you've invented. And, you know, you get to say what people say. <laughs> um, and I'm not a very controlling person in real life, I don't think. Um, and so I think that's the way I, I kind of exercise that muscle in some way. Now, we have to take what our past was into the future because that's that's what informed us, what shaped us and comes out in our work, I think. Well, we have some wonderful questions already from our listeners and uh, participants. So I thought I would share one. Um, about um, the best piece of writing advice you've received that you still use in your writing? That's such a good question. Um, I, I kind of have a pat answer to this and I, I know I've, I've said it many places before, but it, it really is true for me that I, I, my best piece of writing advice I got from the Nike ad, just do it. I mean, that is just, there's just, there's no other way around it. I spent, I have spent, you know, probably years of my life trying to do other things in preparation for writing or, um, I don't know. I just, I, I, I feel like you make so many excuses. Oh, I can't write today because of this. Oh, you know, next week's going to be too hard. That, that kind of thing. Oh, you know, my study really, really is a mess. And truly, truly, my study is such a mess. And I've created a place where you can't really see it because it's all on the ground now. But um, I just think, just do it. And it's, you know, and, and I know that Kingsley Amos said, um, you know, the art of writing is the application of the seat of one's trousers to the seat of one's chair or something or the cushion of one's chair or something like that. Also, you know, a good one. <laughs> um, a, a question about Euphoria. Euphoria is one of my all-time favorite novels. Thank and uh, I recommend it to everyone I know. What led you to write a novel based on historical figures? I didn't mean to. I truly, truly didn't mean to. I thought I was going to write something else entirely. And... Um, I, I, a friend took me to a bookstore that was closing and there was hardly anything there. And I bought the Margaret Mead book for $5 and I really thought I would never read it. And 
I think I was bored one night and I just picked it up and I was completely just hooked, not thinking that I would write anything about her. I was just really interested from the moment that book began, you know, I was interested in her little childhood, you know, which normally is, can be kind of the boring part of the biography. Um, but then I got to when she was 31 in Papua New Guinea and she just married her second husband. And from what I can tell, there were only three anthropologists in all of Papua New Guinea. And she happened to fall in love with the other one. <laughs> and, uh, and, and there's just this part, it's only like 11 pages or something, but it was I just, I, I just thought this would make a great novel. And for a long time, I just didn't think it was going to be me who was going to write that novel. Um, I thought I was going to write something else, but I got so interested that I, I kept on reading books and, and um, taking notes. And, and then by the end of it, I had this whole green notebook full of notes on, on, on the situation. And also in the notes, I would like write out scenes and I would imagine things and, I was already kind of writing the novel, but I was actually writing Father of the Rain. Um, and so, and then, and then I just, then I ended, I decided to go for it. And everybody I told just laughed their ass off at me. I mean, they just thought it was the stupidest idea. I couldn't even tell my editor because she hates historical fiction. <laughs> I, I, to be honest, don't always love historical fiction. I don't go seeking it out. Um, if there's a little history involved in a really great novel, fantastic. But um, it's, I sometimes I just sometimes don't respond to it, and uh, so I was really the, the last person who expected to write one, but I did, and now I kind of want to write another one. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things that you were just saying in your description of writing in your notebook is that you actually put pen to paper. You're not sitting at a computer necessarily, from what you've just said. No, that is true. That is true. I do. And I, I have um, the notebook right here that I'm working on my, I guess it's my sixth novel on. Um, do you, do you, do you want me to show it to you? <laughs> yeah. All right. I'll just tell you how I do it. I mean, I just start, I, I really love writing by hand because um, I love that you can just write all over and I cross out things, but I don't lose anything. I, I, when I'm on the computer, I don't like to leave, I do leave cross outs and everything, but I like to clean it up. And this, you know, I can't clean this up and I don't want to, because sometimes I use that cross out stuff afterwards. Um, and I just, I just really like it because I can draw things. If I'm having a dinner party, I can draw the table, I can draw the people and I do a lot of drawing. <laughs> um, and then I, in the back of my notebook, um, I, I do a number of things and I, I keep about 20 pages in the back empty and I just start writing notes. Um, like I, I, I usually mark it like this so I can find it easily. And, and then I just, I just um, all the ideas that I get in the middle of the night or in the car, they get into this notebook at the end. Um, and then when things get really crazy, then I, um, you know, I, I have a little timeline and I just sort of, uh, it's just little ideas about where the book might go. And so I don't always follow it, but I like, I like having it. Um, I know this every, every year, this gets more and more archaic and weird <laughs> to the younger generation. Um, and then I love, I do a lot of calendar work, a lot of, you know, you come on, you got to finish this. You got to do this by then. And when are you going to write? And, and then I keep myself honest, but I keep a writing log and I say, how much I've written and when I've written just so I can remember. Um, and you know, two pages, two pages of this notebook, perfectly good day for me. I, I know there are a lot of people who like make themselves write like 10,000 words <laughs> like that. I am not like that. I just sit down and whatever comes out, comes out. And I hope it's two pages or more, but it's not always. And that's okay. Cause it might be a good paragraph. And so then when I'm done with that, then I put it all on the computer. Um, and sometimes I, I take breaks and I put stuff on the computer. Right now I have to put like 50 pages on and I, I have to do that, but I keep putting it off. Um, but it, the, it's a really nice revision process for me to, to, to put it on there. And I change things around and um, uh, with the writing uh, handwritten, I'm, I'm very interested in um, 
allowing myself to write whatever I want to write and not worrying about kind of this critical voice. I try to keep the critical voice out of the handwritten phase. And then when I put it on the computer, then I get a little more critical and I, but I also have the creative, you know, we're kind of working together and then, and then I print it out. I kind of try to leave it alone for a couple of weeks once it's all on the computer. And, and then I begin the real critical process of just fixing it all. <laughs> and then that takes many drafts. No, I, I, I'm with you. I mean, my questions for you today are all on paper with pen. Oh, good. I, I totally <laughs> get that. Um, and um, I'm glad to know that I'm not the only one. <laughs> um, we have a question from Vermont. Is okay. there something about writing from the state of Maine that helps you with the process? Maine has been a great place for me to write. And I, I, I don't know why. Um, we moved here because we had just had our second child and we were living in Cambridge. And it was really the parking, to be honest, and the red lights that were getting me because my kids would just scream at every red light. <laughs> and then and I remember one time I wanted to go to the post office and I couldn't find anywhere to park. And I had these two little kids and I didn't have a stroller. Anyway, um, I had always had a dream to move back to Maine because I had lived here when I was in my mid 20s. And um I, I don't know. It, it, I didn't expect um, to find such an incredible writer's community here, but there really is. I had no idea. I did not, I did not know one writer who lived here when I moved here. Um, but it's, it's a, it's a really great community and there are great writer communities in, in every place in every city. And I know, and I did have a great writer's community in Massachusetts, just kind of fledgling, um, and I, I, I know I would have had equally, you know, a great community there. But this has been, this has been a great place for me. I, I, I honestly, I can't say why. Um, but you feel it. You know it. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, sure. There are long winters. You don't feel guilty, not being outside. <laughs> I love tea. I drink tea a lot. There are lots of good tea drinking days in Maine. I don't know. It's cozy. It, it's certainly a very, very, very cozy place. And uh, I like to feel cozy when I'm writing. All right. On that cozy note, we're going to take a little bit of a break. Um, I would like to introduce uh, my colleague, Sandy Chin, who is going to tell us um, about getting more involved with the GBH Foundation. Sandy? Thank you, Laura. And hello, everyone. I'm Sandy Chin from GBH's Member Engagement Department. And thank you all so much for joining tonight's Beyond the Page with Laura Carlo and our author for the evening, Lily King. And if you enjoy Beyond the Page events like today's event, please consider supporting this series by donating to GBH. And with your help, we can continue to host a community brought together by the news, education, entertainment, and so much more. And today, when you give $5 a month as a GBH sustaining member or a one-time gift of $60, you will have your choice of receiving a signed copy of Lily King's beautiful novel, Writers and Lovers, or a signed copy of her collection of stories, Five Tuesdays in Winter. King has been described as a great li literary treasure weaving us through beautiful stories of love, loss, and everything in between. And both pieces of work are written with King's trademark humor, heart, and intelligence. Writers and Lovers follows Casey in the last days of a long youth in Boston and at a time when every element of her life comes to a crisis. Writers and Lovers is a transfixing novel that explores the terrifying and exhilarating leap between the end of one phase of life and the beginning of another. And told in the intimate voices of unique and endearing characters of all ages, Five Tuesdays in Winter tells the tale of a bookseller's unspoken love for his employee that rises to the surface, a neglected teenage boy finding out much needed nurturing from an unlikely pair of college students, a girl's loss of innocence at the hands of her employer's son, and a proud nonagenarian raging helplessly 
in his granddaughter's hospital room. The choice is yours, and when you donate today, there are three ways to do so. You can visit gbh.org slash support events. You can text GBH to 800-204-3811 using the keyword GBH to donate, or scan the QR code right here on the screen behind me now to open the donation form on your smartphone. It's that easy. Please go to gbh.org slash support events. Click on that link that you see in the chat tab now and contribute what you can. And please consider becoming a GBH sustainer tonight. For $5 a month, sustainers serve as a steady and reliable source of support for GBH, allowing us to keep the news and programming you love on air and online. You watch or listen to GBH programs all year long, so why not spread out your support of GBH throughout the year? And as a gift, you will receive one of Lily King's incredible books. And we are so excited that you are here with us tonight. And we hope you, we can continue to have your support to be able to create more events just like this one. And now back to you, Laura. I'm gonna say thank you so much, Sandy. And um, we are going to get back to our conversation with Lily King, but just a quick reminder, uh, we'd love to hear or see your questions show up on the screen. So don't be shy. We'll get to as many as we can. Uh, we have a question from Brookline Mass. Uh, do you find it is equally challenging writing in the voice of both a male and female protagonist, or is one easier for you than the other? I really, I, I wrote a lot of those short stories in the male, um, in a male voice. And I just, I, I, I really enjoy that a lot. Um, I've only written half a novel in a, I it was alternating a son and a mother and the male voice. Um, oh, well, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Euphoria is also in a male voice. I like that. I, I don't, I don't, I don't know exactly why um i i guess it's a it's a it's a sort of escape and it's so fun to inhabit um another life you know with a another whole set of experiences and i don't i don't know when it comes to me i, I don't i don't feel like it's harder um and i think that there's something so exciting and challenging about it that it's a little more interesting to me while I'm writing it. I get a little more kind of zing and and I don't know, a sense of a sense of fun when I'm doing that. And uh, we have a question. Um some time ago I heard your book Euphoria was optioned for the movies. Mm. Did the movie ever get made? It did not. <laughs> right now the BBC has it and it's a limited series. Um, I have not heard from them in a long time. I, I think there's a pilot um, that was written and um, I, uh, you know, I, I'm not feeling all that hopeful about it, but you never know. Um, Writers and Lovers was bought outright um, by Tony Collette, um, who is going to direct it. Uh, I don't have a timeline on that, but but um, but that wasn't just an option because an option runs out and and then it's on back on you know for sale again. Um, but writers and lovers is is um, has 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 been bought outright, so that was great. And she'd better make it right here in Boston. I can't imagine that story anywhere else. I know. I certainly hope so. <laughs> um, a question from uh, one of our listeners how did you find your agent and mm. how much are they involved in bringing your manuscript to publishers yeah they that um very heavily um i've had two agents my first one was for my first three books um and her name was wendy weil and she was fabulous and she died very suddenly of a heart attack um after father of the rain came out and i was writing euphoria um, at that time it was awful. Uh, and I wrote to my editor, Elizabeth Schmitz at Grove Atlantic. And I also wrote to my friend, Kathy Pores, who I waited tables with 
and was also an English major with in college. Um, but I, I didn't know her from classes. I just knew her from, from, from our restaurant that we worked at. And she became an editor at Algonquin. And so I wrote her both, I wrote both of them asking, okay, I, I need a new agent. What do I do? I, I was so, mm. um, and they each sent me very short lists and on both lists was a woman named Julie Bear. And I just kind of felt like it was a sign. I'm, I'm like that. <laughs> and so I was supposed to go and interview a number of agents and I didn't, I just contacted Julie. I went to see Julie. Uh, I was supposed to meet her for 10 minutes in her office. I think I stayed for like an hour and a half and we just completely hit it off. And I, it's just been a really, really, really great fit for me. And so when I'm done with a book, she, um, reads it, edit it, edits it lightly, pretty lightly, but we have a good conversation about it. And I, I tweak things and then, um, she sends it to my editor and I've had the same editor for all of my books. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, but the first time we sent it to Wendy sent it to, um, a number of editors, I think maybe nine. And, uh, and I got really lucky because there was an auction. And, and so there were, you know, a, a couple of publishing houses um, vying for it. Uh, and, but I found it much harder to find an agent than a publisher. I had, a, I had, a, I was a long time finding Wendy and it took her a long time to read it. And then it took her a long time to respond um, after, you know, after I had handed in a revision and it was, it was a, very slow, frustrating process, um, and and completely different than than when I found you know when I got an editor that was that was a very fast process. So I was lucky, and everybody has a different experience. But agents, for especially for novels, are are really crucial. Okay, so we're not going to go it on our own. In other words, those days are long past, right? I mean, I think every now and then you will definitely hear a story like that. Um, but for the most part, I think it's to get, I, I, you know, editors are swamped, especially now that they come electronically. I sent all mine in boxes, you know, and uh, and and now they just come in an email. And, and I think it's like hundreds of day a day. And so when it's when it comes within an email from an agent that they know, it just, you know, you have just a much better chance of getting read. A question from writers and lovers. Why do we fall for these types of men? <laughs> the woman. <laughs> Wait, can you, I'm sorry, I was laughing. I didn't hear the last part of that. Why do we fall for these types of men, but loved the woman? <laughs> well, it's funny. I, I think it's interesting that, that this person is taking... Um, uh, I don't know. Like, I, I feel like there's, I don't want to ruin it for anybody. So <laughs> there's one guy who isn't the right guy. And then there's one guy who is the right guy. But when you say these types of men, I'm thinking you're feeling like neither guy was the right guy. Um, and I understand that, 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 that some people that would not be their type. Um, but that is my type. And that was Casey's type. <laughs> uh, and <laughs> And I don't blame her for a second for falling for him. Um, although there were there were some red flags at the beginning. I think he he, you know, proved himself worthy by the end. But uh that other type, <laughs> that's all has to be in code. Um that is that is a type that is very, very appealing and attractive at first. And then you find out what is and what is not under the surface. We have a question from the Cape. But um, I want to say that's part of a longer conversation, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> with, with, with cups of tea and being cozy. Exactly. Exactly. Um, I love your books, Lily King. Thank I you. also love hearing that you read Judy Bloom as a young reader. What do you like to read now for pleasure? Well, I'm glad you asked that because usually I blank on that question because there are so many novels I read I love so much. But I just read just such a good novel 
Jenny Erpenbeck. Um, she's German. And this is, oh, I'm not going to get this right. Maybe her fifth or sixth novel. Um, and it's called Kairos, which is K-A-I-R-O-S, Kairos. It's the god of good fortune. And um, I love this book so much. Um, I, I don't know. There's something about it that really, really, really fed me as a writer. And those books are are far and few between. I can I, I like a lot of different kinds of books, but there's a book when when I'm writing a book that that you know that I just that I need that I never know exactly what it is. And this book is set in East Germany. It starts in 1986, and it's about a love affair between a 19 year old and a 50 something year old. And but the love affair it's really interesting because I usually am a sucker for the love affair. But the backdrop is the wall is going to fall. And that tension is the real tension in the book, is the the political tension and, and how they're going to navigate that. And, and just reading about what it's like to live in East Germany in 1986 and have been raised because this 19 year old, you know, doesn't know anything different. And the the way politics, the way it's all woven into the relationship is so fascinating and so skillfully done. She used to be an opera director and you can tell because she is just, she is just orchestrating this book in so many ways. I just loved it. I can't say enough about it. <laughs> I have a lot of other favorites, but was that's... that, that was the first book by her you had ever read. Yes. I own three of them. And, you know, if you go to Europe, they're on the tables, you know, she's so big in Europe and not very well known here. So twice I've, I've gone to Europe and gotten her books and brought them back and not read them, which is just a mistake. Um, but now finally I'm turned on to her. So now I'm reading another one by her. She's phenomenal. We have a, a question that says, I enjoyed reading Writers and Lovers. Your description of working in a restaurant was quite accurate. <laughs> I thought so too. <laughs> What was your inspiration and was that based on real events? Yeah, I mean, I definitely drew from my own experiences for that novel, for sure. I worked in um, a restaurant in Harvard Square um, and many, many restaurants in many different states. Um, just a lot. A, I mean, basically a career waitress while I was trying to write novels. Um, and... Uh, I, when I was trying to write my first novel, I had the same feeling that Casey did. You know, I just started, and I was older than Casey um, when I kind of had this time in my life that I, I that I tried to write about. Uh, I was a couple of years older, so like 32, I guess 32, 33. Um, and just this sense like that my life wasn't, moving on that how was I gonna how was I gonna get married how was I gonna have children how was I gonna have a career when I was still waitressing and writing this novel that I couldn't seem to finish and um and the anxiety about that just got worse and worse and um and you know you throw in a heartbreak or two and <laughs> all kinds of things um and and I was I was trying to 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 process that that um, that desire to have a career that doesn't seem to want you you know and uh, and and kind of just a little bit what you have to sacrifice and how everybody else is is moving on and becoming like a grown up and having an office job and having a salary and like an apartment all to themselves. Like I, that was not something I could afford um, really ever. <laughs> and uh, until I sold my first book. And, and so I was just trying to really explore those feelings, those emotions. I was really interested in the emotions. And also when I was writing that book, well, before I started writing that book, cause I was writing something else, my mother died. And this book is a lot about grief um because her mother dies before the book starts and I just needed a place to put all those feelings so when I came up with this idea of this woman and then I get and then I 
I had her mother already having died. It was just on I, vacation. She died on vacation. Like my mother did. Yeah. I totally stole that from, from my own experience. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, that also leaves you vulnerable though, when you're sharing and whether or not people know it's really from your life, that's, that's a very brave thing to do. You know, it's funny about vulnerability. I mean, it, it, I, I mean, the conversations that I've had since I wrote that book with readers, um, it's just been, this was such a little tiny personal experience that I had, you know, trying to write my first novel. And I just thought when I was writing it, I thought it was so bad and so um, not interesting to anybody. And um, I don't know, There, there's something about, about hearing from people and having people say, this is exactly how I felt, you know? I, it is so, it, it is, it does not make me vulnerable at all. It makes me feel so, so glad and, and so connected, so connected to other people and, and, and as a result, stronger. And so it's just sort of the opposite. Weirdly, you feel vulnerable when you're writing it alone in your, in your study and you feel like you're failing every day. That's, that's where the vulnerability is. Um, but once it gets out in the world, it just, I don't know, you know, speaking whatever truths you have inside you however it comes out and sometimes real truths come out in a completely fictional way um it is just it's a very empowering thing we have a question are you more of a plotter mm. or a pantser thank you so much for answering the question okay a pantser like by the seat of my pants kind of thing yeah. i think yeah uh, well, I try, I mean, I'm not a plotter in that I can't sit down and, and write all the plot points. I think what I do is I, I have this idea of an emotional arc, an emotional sort of journey that I want the character to go on. And I usually have a sense of that journey, that emotions, like what emotions that character will feel. Um, I have a sense a little bit of of where they'll start and will that where they'll end up and maybe a few things along the way you know kind of an arc but a lot of times it's just the emotion and i have to find all the events that are going to that are going to happen and so i'm really really kind of feeling my way um kind of intuitively and 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 not, not I mean I, I have my little timeline of things that I think could happen but they don't always happen so I'm a little bit of plotter in that way um but I'm very flexible and if something's not working then I'll do something else and I don't get locked in to to, to anything do you surprise yourself yeah yeah I mean some things that I think I'm aiming for I've been aiming for for like three months you know and 100 pages I get there and I'm like, oh, well, this is not working. <laughs> or and then, you know, with, with Euphoria in particular, there's this one scene where they have a breakthrough and they're all together. And uh, I was I was writing the whole book toward that scene. And then I got there and I felt like I couldn't do it. I just I felt I just had terrible, terrible, terrible performance anxiety where I just I felt like I I built it, I built it, I built it. And then I couldn't deliver the scene that I built everything for, there was just too much pressure on it. Um, but I didn't give up on that. I wrote it and I wrote it again. And, you know, and eventually I was, I, I, I got over my feelings of, of failure about it. And, and I felt like I conveyed something, but of course, you know, Elliot writes, there's, you know, between the, the ideal, Oh God. And the reality falls the shadow. And, and I, and I feel like, the, the shadow haunts you, you know, you have this, this vision and you can never quite achieve exactly your vision. All, all you can do is kind of get close to it. Uh, we have a question, aspiring writer from Quincy, Mass. 
going through a career transition with no formal training. I agree there's a level of risk and trepidation, but I'm ready for new adventures. What are your strategies to get unstuck from writer's block? Mm. And what resources, yeah, and what resources do you recommend to learn more about the writing process from pen paper to final publication? So two parts there. First of all, congratulations. I'm very, very happy for you. And I wish you so much luck with it. And I just think the the best thing you can do is just don't listen to your inner critic. Do not listen when you're writing your first draft. Just just really try to be good to yourself and allow yourself to write, you know, whatever comes out and you can fix it later. Like don't try to be a perfectionist on the page with the first draft. I think that is just so important. Um, and I think it really is the thing that stops really good writers from, from ever writing anything. I mean, I, I can't even tell you the people I know in my experience of, you know, grad school and college and even high school, I, I mean, I, I have studied with some truly great writers who have never written anything because the critic is just overdeveloped and crushing. So I, I just wish you just, just have fun and enjoy it and be good to yourself. And you can, on the next draft or the next draft, you can fix whatever's wrong. I would say that first. And I think the writer's block, that's a lot what that is. That, that is the, the overdeveloped critic just crushing you saying, you know, that this isn't good enough. I quit my job for this, kind of all that, all those feelings. And, and if you could just really let them go, um, meditate, get a therapist, whatever you need to do, I would do that. Um, was there, was there, were there other things I needed to answer? <laughs> no, the, it was a two-part question. Um, um, the, oh, the, 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 the getting from, from page to publishing. Yeah. I mean, it just really is, it's just a, a just do it thing. And then, and don't worry about an agent until you have a per, like not perfect. I don't want to say perfect, but a real a draft that you feel um, is really good. And, or even if you don't, I never feel like my drafts are really good. Uh, just like, you can't do anything else with it. And you've given it to some readers and they've helped you, you know, I, I really getting a writer's group, incredibly essential, taking um, a local writing class, so many in Massachusetts um, and so many like Grub Street has all the stuff online. Um, so lots and lots of opportunities. I would find a writer's community too, because they will feel, make you feel less crazy most people in your life will not understand what you're doing and uh, you know, want you to give up after a little while. <laughs> we have um, just a couple of minutes left. So let's do some, what I think would be quick questions. Uh, one uh, person's asking, love that you handwrite your books into notebooks. Do you have a favorite brand of notebook? Weirdly, I do. I, you know, I think it becomes a little superstitious thing eventually because I've written so many novels and they're just mead. I get them at Staples. Um, and, uh, and I like for years, I've been writing on these kind of, um, they look recycled, they're ivory colored. And I would like to say they are recycled and maybe once upon a time they were, but I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent convinced that these ivory pages are actually recycled. Um, but they're what I really like to do my work on it and um i used to write with just uh, a white um white page notebook narrow ruled but these are actually just college ruled um i has to be spiral has to have a little pocket at the beginning um can't be you know like a three subject sort of thing just one subject so that's what i do and pencil <laughs> i wish i could write you know in like beautiful inks and stuff but i can't all right, um, with, with just the clock ticking down now, um, is there any other art form or art forms you enjoy engaging in? Oh, I love that question. Um, I used to really like to draw and to paint. Um, oh, okay, I take pottery. 
like everybody else in the world right now. Um, and I love that so much. I cannot say I'm at the point where it's actually artistic. It's just, you know, <laughs> I'm just lucky if I can center something and make a mug. All I seem to want to make is mugs for my tea in my, in my cozy winters. Um, and I'm going to move on to bowls uh, eventually. But um, so I like that. I used to do more drawing and painting, but my children, my, my husband is a really talented painter. My mother-in-law who recently died is a very talented painter. And my children both went to art school. They're extremely, extremely good with many, many different kind of visual art forms. And now I'm too embarrassed to do any of that around them. <laughs> so that's great because inspiration will come from anywhere. And, uh, and, and it's true. The creativity kind of travels, you know, across genres and across disciplines. Exactly. Once you unlock it. Well, I, I can't believe that the time is already over. I mean, I feel like we've got 7,000 more questions to ask you. Uh, and maybe when uh, novel number six is done, I we'll get so. back to talk to talk more about um, process and the new novel. I uh, love want to say thank you, Lily King, for joining us tonight. You you don't know how exciting it is for us to meet a real author whose works we have enjoyed uh, and going on this journey with you. Thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you, Laura. And thank you all so much, so much for being here. It really is an honor. Thank you. And we thank you too, uh, our participants tonight. And uh, whether you asked a question or you've just been enjoying hearing Lily talk about the writing process and what she's gone through, we love that you joined us. Um, so before we wrap up, we just want to remind you that you can register for our next Beyond the Page event. It's going to be on October 3rd. So it's coming up in just a couple of weeks. It's going to be with American historian Taya Miles. You can register now by following the link in the chat uh, below. And um, again, we just want to say thank you to Lily and uh, thank you to everybody who signed up and joined us tonight. Uh, I hope you will uh, be part of more of our Beyond the Page events coming up. And I hope you'll join me tomorrow morning at 5 a.m. on 99.5 WCRB. Thank you so much for supporting WGBH. Have a nice evening. Thank you.